Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I see that there's still quite a number of people who came back for this session. Uh, but let, let me first thank Jan for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I, I guess my talk will be a little different from the talks that you've already heard. Uh, I think this morning plus uh, early this afternoon, you heard a lot about models. And of course, models are important uh, because uh, models allow you to actually test scenarios. Uh, and, but they, they know there's not, I guess, maybe not, not too much has been uh, said about how models are being built. So the model building process clearly involves data. Uh, in, in some cases, the data already clean process. But in many, many cases, uh, and especially in, in cases, uh, for example, if I work with a sociologist, uh, then he's going to have data, but it's not clean. Uh, and we will have to actually participate in the cleaning process and actually to s select the data sets that will be relevant for the model building itself. So, uh, so, so the, when, I, when, when Jan first invited me to give the talk, uh, he, he gave a short write-up about the, 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 the aim of this uh, workshop. Uh, and then by reading this, by reading that write up, I kind of uh, crafted this talk a long time ago. So uh, just before before I wrote the abstract, I kind of had a a uh, storyboard of the, the talk uh, drawn out, sketched out, and then I wrote the abstract. And I realized that maybe it's not that best, not the best fit possible. But I'll try to still uh, make it interesting for the, the the audience here. So this is uh, me. I think the laser pointer will work, right? Uh, not, point, it uh, yeah, it's a tiny little green dot. So this is me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it's it's indication of uh. <laughs> okay, and I am uh, with the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences in uh, NTU, and uh, also affiliated with the Complexity Institute. Um, and I I think uh. uh Sorry. <coughs> oh, stay close to the. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, the let me first uh talk about what, what the, the, the uh, give an outline of what I'm going to say. Uh, so because of the word lens and because I am a physicist, so immediately I think about optics. Uh, I think maybe not the rest of you, but uh, I think about optics and I think about what is the connection between optics and complexity. Uh, and actually, uh, I, I managed to find something. So I'll, I'll share with that with you later. Uh, and um, then I will talk about how we go from knowledge to knowing. This sounds wrong. It sounds like it is of the, the wrong, wrong direction. But I assure you, this is no mistake. Okay, and I'll explain why it is not a mistake. And then finally, I will uh, kind of uh, summarize this uh, with uh, a maybe an, an, an outline by in itself on how you go from complex data to complexity knowledge. So, and hopefully, this will be through some kind of complexity lens. Uh, and let let me so start first from the first part of my talk which is uh, how you go from an optics to complexity. So there must be some kind of analogy that we can draw here. So let's first consider knowing through optics. So here what we see is a star. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it, this is very easy to make. So we just uh, pick the, a, a star object from a PowerPoint, add some glow, and we know that uh, stars give off light in all directions. Uh, and if you put a lens down here to collect that star light, so you collect only this portion of the starlight, not, not all of it, but you can, it's already enough to form an image. Okay? So I, this is physically correct. So if you do take a first year course on optics, this is correct because the image is inverted. Okay, maybe the rest of you don't appreciate the joke, but... <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so this, this, is, uh, this is correct, you know, it, it will, it will, it won't, there will be no marks deducted if I draw this drawing for a first year physics course. Uh, and what is, what is and, and I think nowadays, maybe, you know, because we teach this kind of elementary physics so many times, it has lost its, some of its mystery. And uh, some of the, you know, the, 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 actually the amazing part is that we can get an image of an object so far away just by putting a piece of glass here. Okay? So actually what happens is, what, what the, the reason for this is because light rays carry information about their source. Okay, so all the light ray that is emitted by the star carries information outwards. Okay? And then if you, if you can collect those kind of light rays, okay, uh, through, you, through the lens, and the lens, in order to collect these light rays, needs to perform some kind of transformation to light rays. So the, the, the simplest geometric optics uh, interpretation would be that the lens bends the light. 
But this is also already a transformation of the light ray, changes the direction of light rays, and actually force them to converge here uh, to give you an image. And then, of course, most importantly, <laughs> if the star is, let's say, you know, millions of light years away, and of course, the, 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 a star is a very huge object, and if the image presented to us is the, uh, the same size as the actual star itself, I don't think we can understand anything. We will look at a, a very bright surface and, and we will ask, what is this? Okay? But because it is presented to us at a convenient scale, we can start to you know, ask more questions about the structures of stars and what they are and uh, what they're made up of and what, what they mean uh, in the history, natural history of the universe. So that's knowing through optics. And it turns out that if you know more, you can know even more. Okay? So this is knowing more through optics. We have the star. So I'm still talking about physics here. Uh, not yet complexity, but here we have the star. We have the lens. And now we have intergalactic cloud in between them. So this is a very common situation that we will encounter. Uh, there, there are lots of this kind of uh, junk all over the universe. Uh, and what they do is that they will produce a very blurred image. And that's because this is information. We want to know something about the star. So we consider the image of the star image. But there's also noise, the intergalactic cloud. And because the, the intergalactic cloud is not at the same place as a star, uh, if we can focus the star, we cannot focus the intergalactic cloud, so it looks like noise. But if we do know something about the intergalactic cloud, that means where it is, how big it is, what is the rough density of the, the intergalactic cloud, uh, then it is possible to make use of this knowledge to actually produce a sharp image of the star. Okay? So therefore, if you have additional image, uh, you are able to get even more information by doing some, some kind of uh, noise cancellation. And this is important because uh, frequently with uh, complex systems, complexity problems, there is signal, we know there's signal in the system, but there's also a lot of noise. Okay? So if we know something a little bit about the, the, the sources of these noises, we can devise schemes to cancel them out, just like we can do it for optics. So now, but... Is it, pos is it true then that uh, we can always know about objects, dis uh, distant objects by putting a lens there? And I claim that it is not so simple. Let me show you why uh, the, a sp very important condition for actually knowing. So we have the lens, we have a star, we can form an image. But what if this image appears inside the interior of a planet? Okay? And there are intelligent beings living in the totally dark interior of this planet. Okay, so who, who, uh, I don't know where they get the lens from, but somehow it appeared. Uh, and uh, because the star is at the right position, the image of the star appears. And these, I claim that these beings will not be able to comprehend what this, this thing is. Okay, and why is it that they cannot? Because they have no previous encounter with a star. They live in a totally dark interior of a planet. Uh, and also, they have no understanding how lenses work. Well, they, they live in the dark, so they have no need for lenses until uh, this particular point where somebody opened up the, their planet, the shell, outer shell of the planet, and inserted a lens. Okay? So, it is not simply, it is not, it, it is not so simple as to find the correct instrument to transform the information. Uh, we also need to be able to comprehend the information. And that's what I want to talk about next. Uh, that is uh, templates of knowledge, uh, and this, this, this you can. So before before I came to this uh, workshop, uh, I completely forgotten about models. Okay, but of course models are important, and models are closely related to templates of knowledge, uh, except that these templates are, I guess, a little bit more general and a little bit more permanent than models, because mm -hmm. models, some of the models, as Sanders said, we are built in order to throw away, uh, but templates we intend not to throw away. We, we keep only those that are the most useful. And let me explain how these kind of templates work. Suppose I am uh, actually observing a new phenomenon. Okay, here's an observation. Here are the rest of the observations. Uh, I wanted to use uh, Sanskrit uh, characters, but I, I can't produce them on my uh, com on com computer, so these are just Chinese characters. Uh, it, the, this is uh, A, B, uh, let me see, which one is C? I think this is C, and then this D, that's E. Okay, that's the Chinese equivalent of A, B, C, D, E. Okay. And then we have O phenomenon, the real A, B, C, D, E. Uh, and then we can, we, you know, we can try to draw analogies. And of course, I think the analogies are not entirely correct. But uh, this, 
It's just an analogy. So we, we can form an, an analogy between old phenomenon and new phenomenon. It doesn't have to be exact. It just has to be a little useful for us to comprehend the new phenomenon in terms of uh, old phenomenon that we already understand. Okay? And uh, we can, but we can go further. You know, after we set up the analogy, we can perform more measurements. So let's say we perform uh, additional measurements and we find that there is this sequential pattern of activations. So if we see this, so there's some kind of a causality or correlation. If we see this uh, observation, make this observation, then we find that later on this observation is also true. true. And once this observation is true, then maybe sometimes this observation is true, sometimes this observation is true, and these are a uh, sequence of successive, successive observations that are the true values. And then, of course, you can do the same thing for the old phenomenon. And you can see now, of course, that the, the analogy is not so accurate anymore. Okay? And you expect this to be you know, uh, true most of the time. And, but in, in, cases where, in cases where you actually can map not just the, the microscopic observations, but also the sequences of observation, then you have something that is really better than an analogy, and that is, will be a rigorous equivalent. And, and what, what that means is that if you have a mathematical model for the old model, then the same mathematical model can be used for the, sorry, a, old, a mathematical model for the old phenomenon, then you can use the same mathematical model or agent-based model for the new phenomenon, okay? And that, that, that is very useful because that means that we don't have to work any further. Uh, any results that we know is true in the old phenomenon, we can uh, put another laser pointer. Okay, any, any result that we know is true for the old phenomenon, we can, we will, we, we, we can be very certain that it will also be hold true for the uh, new, new, new phenomenon. Okay? And effectively, if we have rigorous equivalence, then this old phenomenon here can serve as a template for understanding the new phenomenon. Okay? And I, so, so this is maybe a little new to you, uh, but you, you can think in terms of models. So what I am trying to get at would be a template is a representative model. So there are a lot of models that are very similar to this representative model, and a lot of results that are true in this representative model is also true in the other models that are highly similar. Okay? So next, I will talk about uh, resolution and then aggregation. So here what we have is that we have uh, all objects are considered distinct. We have the highest possible resolution. But uh, actually, maybe you know, it's not so useful. So the highest possible resolution that you can afford to, to, op to obtain in, in the observation may not, be, uh, you, be, may not be very useful because then you have too many distinct objects to deal with. But maybe you can actually treat some of the objects that are close enough as being identical copies of the same thing. So here we have uh, two red dots, three, red, uh, three green dots, and one blue dot. So what you then do is you aggregate them to form a red cluster, a green cluster, and a blue cluster. So you have, in fact, uh, so you group similar objects together, you lower the resolution. So you sacrifice some resolution. But of course, it will be, it will be stupid to do so if there's no gain. So what is it that we gain in this process? Actually, what we gain is we can increase the signal-to-noise ratio. Let's, let's say that you know, the, the, the other uh, white objects down here, they are noise. So they, these are things that when you measure, you know, they, don't, they don't actually help answer your question. Uh, these colored ones help you answer your questions, uh, but you don't get enough sig uh, signal to noise ratio if you work with individual ones. But after you aggregate them partially, uh, you, can, you can get better signal to noise ratio. And if you think of doing this process, you know, repeating this aggregation process at, at higher and higher scales, then you end up with, uh, a, you may be able to plot a, a graph that looks like this. When on the x-axis is scale, so this can be length scale or time scale. Uh, a length scale would be, uh, for example, if I go back here uh, and we try to aggregate more uh, circles, that would be uh, increasing length scale. Uh, if we watch this thing evolve in time and then we uh, group them according to their time evolution, uh, depending on how long a time window we choose, that would be uh, the time scale. So we, we here, so this x-axis represents the scale. And on the y-axis, what I want to show would be the emergence of new information. So let's say that we see new information appearing here at this particular microscopic scale. So this is a small scale. And then later on here, later on here, later on here, 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 and so on and so forth. Okay? So what, what is important is to, to, re to recognize is that 
when I, when I draw something like this, there is actually new information at this scale. So this is a feature of complex systems. That is to say, uh, I think I understand something about the system up to this scale, and then at this scale, suddenly I realize that there's something new. Okay, and then I, I go on again. Uh, here, there's no new, no new, no further new information at this scale. But then, if I if I get to this point here, there will be new information. Okay, so this is the the, the notion of emergence that there is new information organization at different scales. So, for example, if I uh, if you go back to the the the, 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 the picture of uh, the the balls with uh, the colors, so you're trying to group them, and you find that you may be grouping objects that are close together. Uh, until you reach a certain length scale, and suddenly you have to group objects that are very far apart. Okay, so once you start doing that, you have actually the information content has changed. So the, the, the there is new information organization, and it appears at a very specific length scale and maybe time scale as well. And we have to reflect that through a graph like this. And and whenever there is new information organization, okay, you may actually new a new uh, you may actually need a new template. For, to understand the, the phenomenon that is happening there. Okay? So this may, if, if this sounds very abstract, then let me go on to talk about uh, the, the, the second part of my talk, which is on from knowledge to knowing. So effectively what I mean when I say from knowledge to knowing is to say that in order to know new phenomenon, we need to, use, we need to actually utilize uh, previous knowledge. So the previous knowledge acts as the template for understanding new, uh, new information, uh, and one of the templates that I've used a lot in uh, the, the work that we, I have done in my group is the chemical reaction template. So let me explain this chemical reaction template. First, you start off reactants, say AB, the AB molecule, and then uh, it, it, it encounters the CD molecule, and then it forms a transition state where the A, B, and C are temporarily, temporarily <laughs> bonded, uh, and then eventually it forms products. So it can, it can form, let's say, uh, a, B, C plus D, or A plus B, C, D, or A plus B, C plus D. <coughs> so in, in chemistry, you know, there's a lot of complexity as well. You don't just get one, uh, one kind of product at the end. Usually you get uh, a mixture of products uh, with different branching ratios. Okay? Uh, and so this, this is just to illustrate that you can have many different outcomes. And then you, uh, what, what a chemist will do is that they will summarize uh, this, this understanding into a, a, gra a, a graph like this, where you start from an initial state, you end up with a final state, and you are here at the transition state uh, where there is an energy barrier. So this, this, this process is not spontaneous. Uh, you need to first overcome some energy barrier, delta E, and then it will take place. Uh, in other cases, you might have to actually climb out of one, uh, one energy well, and then go, go and then go spontaneously go down to another energy well, and of course you know this template is useless if it does not have important features of complex systems and the dynamics. So I show you that it, it, indeed it has. So first of all, we know that uh, complex systems tend to be history dependent. So they are they are context sensitive. They are they are path dependent. So there's a lot of a. Uh, uh, the, the, the exquisite detail of the, the conditions surrounding the, the transition uh, makes a difference to the outcome. Uh, and let me show you how this is, this, this is true for chemical reactions. So same thing again, AB molecule uh, reacting with the CD molecule forms the transition state. And this transition state eventually gives you to, let's say, the dominant product, ABC and D. Now what if the molecules AB and CD encounter, encounter so this, there's reaction here. What if the molecules A, B, and C, D encounter uh, each other in this particular configuration? Because we know that you know, in, in when, when the molecules are hurtling through space, they, they are frequently rotating and vibrating. So they may actually encounter each other, not with the B end facing the C end, but with the A end facing the D end. You may still have some kind of a transition state, but then you end up with uh, no, no reaction. Okay, because it, is, it doesn't give... It, it doesn't give uh, it doesn't end up with the product that you want because the, the conditions are simply not right. So this is initial condition dependent, history dependence. Okay? But there is also another feature that is uh, seen in complex systems. I, I call this adaptation here, uh, but that it is actually uh, kind of a dual to the, the, the initial conditions uh, uh, problem that I described earlier on. So let me show you what this is. Again, the molecule A, B, and C, D. 
okay they can form this transition state and then go on to give rise to the product a b c and then d but this uh, this is and this may be the preferred outcome so this might be when everybody is happy uh, and if let's say a b c are p individual humans instead of a chemical species but let's say that this transition state live long enough so it lives maybe you know for a few microseconds and in within this few microseconds actually there is potential for it to rearrange okay so it folds and then it rearranges itself so that they, now there's a temporary bo temporary bond between a and d as well and because of these two temporary bonds now you have a totally different outcome okay a d and b c okay so so a chemical reaction you think that this is simple but it doesn't always give you the same outcome so one of the reasons why it does not give you the same outcome is because of the configuration where the reactants are brought together uh, can be different uh, from encounter to encounter the another reason why you can have different outcomes is because of this internal dynamics of the transition state so if there is rearrangement within the transition state you can get a different outcome so the root of wicked problems may actually be a combination of path dependence uh, in, together with internal dynamics so actually I, what i'm showing you here is that the chemical reactions template is rich enough to actually describe uh to describe a uh, complex system complex complexity problems and uh, let me now talk also a little bit about another feature of uh complex systems although uh, a lot of the, the speakers here feel that uh, actually it is it should be impossible to control complex systems but that cannot be true because chemical reactions are also complex systems and chemists have been doing pretty well over the years okay so let me show you how the chemists do this so in, in the, within this template again you have the a, a b molecule reacting with the c d molecule you go through the, the transition state you get your product a b c plus d maybe now this time around this is not the preferred outcome okay but if you now introduce a catalyst usually it's a surface and the molecule the, the a b molecules and d c molecules uh, stick to the catalyst in this particular manner and then they can form temporary bonds a to d and b to c and then afterwards uh, the, these original bonds can be broken and new bonds can be formed and then you get your desired outcome so what have the chemists, chemists uh, achieved uh, in this in this part uh, in this process here they have steered the chemical reaction which would normally proceed in this fashion to proceed in this fashion by introducing something else so if we believe if we believe that the chemical reaction template is a good enough template for complex problems then what we need to do would be to discover what are these things that we need to put to throw into the problem so that we can actually steer the chemical reaction away from the natural outcome so this can you can think of these uh, for social problems this will be for actual policy interventions uh, to achieve a preferred outcome of course you know uh, the, the chemist has how did the chemist discover the, the catalyst effectively usually it's by you know um, just by accident they, they know the, the, the test tube is not clean and then suddenly there's a lot of reaction okay, that's, that's a pretty common uh, possibility uh, and then after they realize that if you throw junk into into the, chemi the chemicals and the reaction rate will be uh, will be sped up or you can select for a particular reaction then they start throwing more, all kinds of junk inside there and see whether you, you can you can accelerate the, the, the reaction that you want and of course they only publish the one that works okay so they have they probably throw, throwing nearly everything into the, the test tube uh, and gotten you know this this kind of stuff here uh, but for of course for human societies we I don't think we are prepared to throw everything in okay so we, we want a more principal approach and indeed it can be that it can be achieved uh, and uh, the, the reason why they, they did they actually have to do this by trial and error is because you know the principle of cat catalysis was not understood when it was first discovered of course now there's a, a lot better understanding about catalysis so you can see here that this chemical reaction pathway is indeed rich enough to use as a template for understanding other complex processes so uh, let me give you two examples of the work that we have done uh, one of them is to understand uh, what happens in the u.s stock market so we downloaded data high frequency data on uh, 10 indices uh, representing the various uh, uh, economic sectors in the u.s stock market and then we we color them we actually uh, we color them according to their volatility their the variance so that the blue re represents uh, very uh, small variance within this time period green intermediate yellow and red means high variance within the period 
Uh, and you can see that, uh, and we have also arranged the, 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 the indices according to uh, the start time of this uh, blue segment down here. And what is this? So this is the year 2003, 2004. Uh, in, two, in, in 2000, in the year 2000, uh, there was of course the sub, uh, not the subprime, sorry, the, the other, the other, the technology bubble uh, are breaking up, uh, and of course the technology sector is right here. Uh, it caused uh, the stock markets to crash, and at this point in time, around two, between 2003 2004, the stock market started to recover. Uh, you can, if you, if you actually just track when the, the, the different sectors recovered. You can see that this is a period of over about one and a half years. So this is the natural recovery rate of the US stock market around this particular period of time. So we don't know whether it is still one and a half years, okay, because uh, the, the current crisis uh, is of a different nature compared to the previous one. Uh, but uh, we have actually checked uh, the Japanese market as well uh, around the same time, and we found that the Japanese market took two and a half years to recover, so slower than uh, the US market. So, but what, what the, the biggest contrast, of course, is not between one and a half years and, uh, and, and uh, two and a half years. Let me show you the reaction of the U.S. market to the subprime crisis. So this is uh, May 2007 to 2008, and of course, this, this is before, before Lehman Brothers. Uh, when we published this paper, it was before uh, Lehman Brothers actually declared themselves bankrupt. And then, uh, then there's, in October, there will be a, a, a pair of crashes. Uh, what you can see is that the, the blue segment disappears and go into intermediate uh, variance uh, segments and then eventually becoming yellow. So if we time this, 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 uh, these segments, the, the end of the blue segment, we find that this is only two months. Okay? So there is the great, the great asymmetry in, in, the stock, in the typical stock market is its uh, ability to recover and its, ability and, and its re response to crisis. So bad news is a lot worse than good news. I mean, the, the bad news produces a far uh, quicker reaction compared to good news does. Okay? Uh, but of course, just, just looking at this kind of time series is it's nice, but it's just a color. Uh, we can do more. So uh, again, you know, I'm supposed to illustrate the chemical reactions uh, template. So we can calculate cross correlations between the indices. So just basically the simple linear cor correlation. And then over the entire time period, okay, we we can show not all the we we can we can we can uh, we can, uh, we can choose to show only the most important uh, cross correlations by choosing to show the minimal spanning tree. So these cross, these lines here represent cross correlations that are the largest in in the in the U.S. Mar stock market, uh, and this is how the the, the 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 different indices are connected to each other. So a lot of uh, a lot of cross correlations are, have been neglected in this picture, uh, and, and the reason why I want to show something like this is because this looks like a molecule, okay? Uh, and therefore we can talk about uh, chemical reactions. Now this this is over the entire uh, eleven year period, but if I focus, let's say between twenty o one and twenty o two, I find that okay, uh, the 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 U.S. stock molecule looks like this, and between twenty o eight and twenty o nine, the stock molecule looks like this. So, or they are all kind of elongated. Uh, then I started looking at 2004 to 2005. This is a period where I've shown earlier on where the U.S. Uh, stock market was actually recovering from the technology bubble. And then when I plot the cross correlation, it looks like this. Okay. So topologically, the the cross correlations look different uh, between during crisis and during growth. Okay. So this we call a, a star to chain kind of transition, uh, uh, chain to star transition. And it is not simply observed, it is not just observed in the US stock market, it is also observed in the Japanese stock market, and uh, some of my Korean colleagues have observed this in the Korean market as well. Okay, and uh, this is the Japanese market. Again, you know, uh, the contrast is here. So this is uh, recovering from the technology bubble. So it's uh, for, for, some, for, some, for reasons I do not understand, so because I'm not an economist, the, 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 the recovery, uh, the, the Japanese recovery took a long time to start. And, uh, and this is the end, and this is two years, three months. So this is longer than the, the U.S. Uh, time scale, recovery time scale. And this is a response to the subprime crisis. Uh, this series of crashes down here is actually in, in re response to the Chinese correction of February 2000, 2007. And then this is the main thing. This is in response to the uh, subprime crisis. And you can see that from the start to the end, it's only 27 days. So the... the Instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, one month, 
so the US market I think was one I forgot how many how many days but uh, it's comparable so again you know you have very fast reaction to crisis but very slow recovery okay uh, and more interestingly for in the in the in the Japanese stock, stock market if we if we split them according to the colors you can see that this period is extremely red this period here is more uh, also very high high variance uh, still high variance and then moderate variance if we split them like this and then we uh, and we of course see no signs of recovery uh, and if we compare uh, subprime 3 and subprime 4 so uh, where is it subprime 3 is here subprime 4 is here so these are distinct periods in the, the Japanese stock market uh, what we see is that the minimal spending trees are a little different but more importantly you can see that here the the rest of the indices are organized around the chemical industry and uh, also around the uh, manuf manufacturing industry but uh, in subprime 4 you see that uh, some of these uh, some of the indices that were originally attached to uh, the chemicals started to move to uh, this particular one here is NFR non-ferrous metals uh, and there's else, else so there is this ph phenomenon that the economists call a flight to quality so we can actually see the brief flight to quality prior to the uh, collapse of the Lehman Brothers so these are things that uh, we can see if we make use of the correct kind of a template uh, and think in the think in terms of the template so th if we think of this as, a, as if there's a chemical reaction a rearrangement how would the rearrange what 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 is happening during re rearrangement we can conclude that there is a uh, an episode of flight to quality here and actually there are more flight to quality episodes in the Japanese stock market uh, because you know they, are, they have 36 sectors and it's very detailed now uh, why do these kind of things happen so we have to understand that fundamentally uh, in the in the market we have traders and we have stocks okay and the, the traders own stocks uh, the, the stocks cannot own a trader uh, but and you can see that each trader will own a number of stocks a different, different number of stocks and let's say you know we start at time zero okay and the price is zero uh, and if one of them uh, buys one stock then the price of the stock will go up there's a price impact and then after that the, the, you know the, the, the transaction is done the next time step you know another trader buys two stocks and th so the price of these two top two stocks go up later on you have maybe say you know three uh, traders uh, buying the same stock and one of them is also buying something different so you can see a higher price Im impact for this stock a low one for here and you keep doing this eventually you get price time series uh, and that's that explains the kind of correlation so fundamentally it is the traders who are actually optimizing their portfolios that is creating all the price movements uh, and these are correlated if the traders are correlated and the traders are correlated if they are they are executing the same strategy so there is the so this brings me to the, the other template that I like to work with a lot and that is brain dynamics so in in the brain we know that of course the brain contains billions of uh, neurons uh, and uh, if you if you put the brain and uh, you know if you if you put a subject test subject under an fMRI scanner you would see that uh, different regions of the brain start to light up when we you know when the test subject is asked to do different things and it is not a single neuron it can be you know anywhere from ten thousands to maybe a million neurons that light up at any one time so there is a lot there's a large area synchronization that happens uh, in in the brain because the neurons are doing the same thing at the same time okay and then after that they will they will they will quiet down and another region of the brain will light up uh, because information has since passed on from one region to another region of the brain uh, and this this is the natural uh, information processing that happens in the brain so do we see something similar in the stock market okay so first of all we go from the uh, bipartite trader stock network to uh, a, a network only of the traders and let's say you know there's, there's, a, there's a transaction here okay sell and there's a transaction there's a buy here and then later on we, we, we see that you now this sell transaction has actually uh, influenced the neighbors of the traders to also sell uh, and but this this buy didn't okay so that's this this is a spontaneous buy order that appears uh, uh, by itself so here you have one synchronization cluster uh, and maybe a new a new a new link can, can be formed uh, this is adaptation and then later on you have another cell cluster over here uh, so there is propagation of cell clusters and buy clusters uh, in, in ways that are very similar to uh, the, the kind of natural information processing that happens in the brain 
Uh, and let's see whether we can see something similar, uh, a similar picture in the Singapore stock market. So what I show you is a period uh, from August to about uh, no late November. Uh, and of course, I marked down the three most important dates. This is the date that Lehman Brothers deca declared themselves bankrupt. This is the first crash in the Singapore stock market, 8th October. This is after the crash in the US stock market. This is the second crash in the, the, the Singapore stock exchange on the 22nd of October. This is uh, on the same day as the Japanese stock market. And then the, the US stock market crashed, I think, one or two days later. Okay, and then what we do is we split this time because we have high frequency data, we can afford to split into two weeks time windows and we analyze the price movement cross correlations. So, and then we re reorder the, the, the cross correlation matrix to produce a color map that looks like this. So you can see from this color map that there is one cluster of stocks that are highly correlated. Uh, these are peripheral stocks. And then there's, there's a, maybe a small bunch of uh, stocks that, are, that forms very small clusters. Okay? And then when you, when you go on to the next uh, time window, you see something different. Okay? <laughs> it seems like the, the, the giant cluster here has broken up. And then when you go to the next one, it is, it's, uh, it's reforming. And it's not surprising that it's reforming in this time window because this is when Lehman Brothers declared themselves bankrupt, filed for Chapter 11 protection. And then uh, right after the, the, the bankruptcy, you see that there's breaking up. And then, uh, and then in this time window that contains the first crash, the cost correlation remain, becomes strong and weaker here uh, and then uh, weaker still. Okay, so this, it's nice to look at all these pictures because we can see the effect of growing and shrinking clusters. But there are things that we do not see because we don't actually see the membership exchanges between clusters. So in a chemical reaction, we can have two big molecules coming together and then two big molecules leaving, okay? Uh, but actually, they may have exchanged a substantial number of members, uh, atoms in, in the process, and we don't know it if we plot it this way. So we, we try to plot it in a different way by making use of, uh, by, 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 by converting this into a diagram that looks like this. So every cluster we will represent by a circle. The size of the circle is proportional to the number of uh, stocks in, 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 the, in the cluster. And then the color will be just to indicate that this, these stocks are not the same as these stocks. And then uh, the next time window, we have another correlation matrix uh, ordered. And then we, 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 we draw out the circles again. And then after, once we have two time windows and we have identified the, the clusters, we can look at the exchange of members. So in this way, we can, we can form something called a fusion-fission diagram. This is only between two time windows. Uh, okay, this is a fusion process because uh, members from different uh, clusters are fusing together into this giant cluster. And this is a fission process because this small guy is breaking up into more than one piece. Okay, so this is over the period from August to, to, uh, sub, uh, to late November. The same, the, the same representation, uh, the fusion-fission diagram representation of the cross-correlations that happen in, in, the, in the stock market. You can see that around this period of time, uh, this, this is where the, the Lehman Brothers filed for Chapter 11 protection. There is this giant cluster. It actually act, it is, it's formed from the fusion of smaller clusters. And then after the, 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 the bankruptcy de declaration, it broke up into smaller clusters, which remain small and continue to fragment until it fuses again here. So this is the first crash. It stayed large until the end of the second crash. So in this way, we can have a... Uh, a, a more detailed uh, picture of the dynamics in the Singapore stock market in relation to external uh, events uh, that, that we have no control over. And of course, if, we, if, the, if, the, if the stock exchange is interested in any intervention, then we, maybe they can draw upon this to understand what is the best way to maybe prevent this, this kind of thing from happening. So naturally, naturally, a stock market would have uh, giant clusters forming and dissipating and forming and dissipating. Uh, he, what, what we have here is a, uh, uh, an episode of critical slowing down. The, the clusters got big and the time scale got slow, so it, it persisted for a long while. Uh, and actually, the interesting thing is that traders know how to deal with this kind of situation, but they don't know how to deal with this situation. So they don't know how to make money here, but they know how to make money here. So anytime there's a, a lot of c series of fragmentation and fusion, uh, they can make a lot of money here. They, they get very edgy. Okay, so this, these are the, 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 the different crashes. Uh, and we see very strong mixing. We've quantified that. Uh, and the same kind of template can also be used to understand uh, earthquakes. 
uh, this, this was a final year project that was completed in 2012. Uh, we looked at 27 stations, GPS stations, uh, scattered around Sumatra. Of course, there, there used to be far fewer, but after the 2004 earthquake, uh, and tsunami that killed a, lot, a, a large number of people. They started to set up all these stations. So we have, uh, we look at the period between 2007 and 2008. The reason for that is because there, there, there is a, actually an 8.5 magnitude earthquake somewhere in, in there. And then we split them into, uh, we, we, we process them into 30 second time series and we split them into 70, 70, uh, 73 non-overlapping five uh, day windows. Uh, so let's not worry too much about the dendrogram. So I, I color the, 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 the we, I got the student to color the, the clusters, uh, the stations, according to their cluster. So the, the same color will indicate the same, uh, same, the same color will indicate uh, stations from the same cluster. So the green will be from another cluster, red will be from uh, an, a, a different cluster. And so this, and you can see that they change frequently. Okay, and, and these, are, these are actually, so what we are doing here, we are clustering based on the noise in the GPS position data. So there is obviously a constant drift. If you, if you, if you try to look at the, the, the relationship between constant drift, they are drifting more or less in the same direction, but the noise are not always in the same direction. Okay, so after we've done this, uh, then we can construct the fusion fission diagram. Okay, so this is how, how that works. And then uh, this, uh, this is not very clear, but uh, <coughs> unfortunately I don't have anything better. So this is uh, if the fusion fission diagram. Uh, over uh, a period of time, and you can see that there is, uh, you can see that there are earthquakes during fu fissions. So we are trying to correlate the, the earthquakes to the the processes that happen in the clusters, and there's also earthquake. Okay, so earthquakes during the fissions, uh, and so we see rapid fusions of clusters and slower fissions of giant clusters, uh, and because these are very regular, we suspect that there might be some climatic forcing. Uh, and this is the period uh, surrounding the earthquake itself. This is the giant earthquake. And you can see that the, the processes down here are very now very different. Uh, in fact, the, the relaxation seems to be very slow. It's, it, it seems to take more than one year, but we unfortunately, we did not have data for uh, after that. So let me now uh, speed up a little bit, okay, uh, to at least, at least talk about how we can get from complex data to uh, complexity theory. So the challenges oh, posed by complex data would be, uh, first of all, List, these are the microscopic variables. Uh, in, in, in the self-organization that happened between these uh, microscopic variables, you end up with hier hierarchy of uh, variables uh, shown in the dendrogram. Okay? And you can afford different descriptions at different scales. And through interactions, these dendrogram actually can rearrange themselves. And you can find that, you know, that they swap places. Okay? So there is not just a hierarchy, but there is also a lot of recombination that happens. And therefore, we can think of these as uh, innovations at different scales, uh, and that which, which explains kind of why wicked problems look so similar, but everyone is still different. Okay, and uh, we apply this uh, this this idea to observing uh, social political sentiments. So this is society, and we have a complexity lens. Uh, I'm sure it doesn't look like this. Uh, and the way to observe society is actually actually just to listen to what they say. So the discussions among people in the society is some form of self-reporting, uh, and we can resolve them into topics, we can aggregate by topics, and then what we want to do is to test for social regime shift. So there's, there's obviously a, a big theory behind uh, regime shift. Uh, this is Martin Schaefer, uh, who made this popular, but uh, I, I, in, in interest of time, I'll just skip all these and just go on to talk about the, the, the main results. Uh, I will skip this as well, so let's quickly go to, whoa, okay. So we want to see, in, in fact, if we think carefully about this, the online discussions are actually perturbations to the social political uh, uh, opinions. So we can have a perturbation here, and it relaxes back to the old, old opinion, and a stronger perturbation, it still relaxes back to the, the, the old opinion, and then a series of uh, strong per perturbations, and now because the the, the system actually has, is getting so close to the critical point there is a rapid transition over to the new opinion set and thereafter even the perturbations cannot bring it back. Uh, and we look at four different forums, data, uh, mine using uh, crawlers written in Scrapey, and then we measure this relaxation rate. So you can see that uh, this is the relaxation rate in the daily number of posts. Uh, and this is the R-square of the fit to exponentials. So actually most of the fits are pretty good, decent. 
Uh, the individual dots are individual threads, and then we have to actually aggregate to get this black line. Okay. Uh, and when we look more close, closely at this uh, black curve, we see something like this. So there's a low here, there's a high here, and what is the meaning? So in, in order to understand that meaning, we actually further separated the threads into political versus non-political. So political is uh, blue and non-political is red. And we can see that, uh, we see that there is a period of critical slowing down here, a period of critical slowing down here, here, and nothing here. Okay, and these all we, we suspect are related to the 2011 general election. And then later on, we, we did some tax co occurrence analysis, which I will skip in the interest of time because it will take me too long to get through this. And then again, we do some uh, filtering of the co cost correlations to end up with uh, this kind of information. So we see two major hubs in this uh, planar maximum filtered graph. Singapore is not a political keyword, but uh, PAP certainly is. So this is a political keyword. So we use this political keywords to split the, the threads into political versus non-political. But more importantly, we also look at the, the words, how the words are actually tied into the political keyword. And we end up with a picture like this. Uh, so this is the degree of the PAP hub. And these are all the words that, are, that appeared in the, in the discussion for in the, in the threads. And then we see that these, are the, these words are first connected to PAP around this time. And then uh, around here, here, so there is a critical slowing down here, and then the regime shift here, and then there is a reset of the regime shift by the general election. Uh, and what we find here is that the, the most important discussions are actually associated with bread and butter issues. Here we see a lot of uh, PAP bashing, which is very common in Singapore, even though pe people say that we don't have freedom of speech, but online there is. Okay? And then after the general election, we, return to, we find that the discussion returned to just bread and butter issues, like how expensive Singapore is, how hard it is to own a car or a house, uh, but no bashing of the ruling party. Uh, but of course, there is something interesting that hap happening here, and there's a lot of cursing and swearing, but uh, those maybe words are too obscene for me to actually show them here. Okay? So the conclusion is, uh, so I've drawn an analogy between optical lens and the complexity lens. So what the optical lens does is that it transforms light rays to form image at an appropriate scale. Uh, and if you have additional information, it allows further processing of the information. A complexity lens, okay? So I have not talked about models at all, but what it does is it transforms data to fit existing knowledge templates. And models actually does the, the same thing. So a model is, is like a knowledge template, and I'll explain why. And of course, you can select the resolution and the scale. Now, the, the knowledge template I have given here, the examples are the chemical reaction template, brain dynamics template, and the regime shift template. Uh, and we, I, I distinguish between templates and models because models are more, uh, less permanent than the templates. We need more templates, but the only way that we can get them is to actually build more models. Uh, so let, I, I think that's all I have to say. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Any questions? <coughs> I find uh, your analysis description of the, the stock market mm -hmm. uh, fa fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and when you, you started your, your analysis, you uh, said um, if we can steer chemical uh, reactions, it should also be possible then for uh, other complex processes. Yes. Um, now, if I look at, at at your description, yes, and I, indeed, I think it is a, it's a nice description, mm -hmm. but for me, it is not clear how I can use yes. that description to steer, in this case, the uh, the stock market. Right. So, if you could elaborate on that, and attaching to that, uh, and related to that, yeah. At the end, uh, you refer to. Another a very fascinating thing that is the early warning systems based on uh, Martin Schaeffer's yes. uh, critical transition yeah. in nature and society uh, theory. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I have seen some some research uh, trying to use that as an early early warning system of stock market right. crashes, uh, and as far as I know, the the the, the work there for me totally expected, has shown that it's very difficult 
to find early warnings, even exposed for stock market crashes, let alone uh, ex ante. Mm -hmm. Because I think in any template you have <coughs> to uh, you have to connect the the the, uh, the behavior of the traders. Yes. To their environment, right. uh, and as far as I can see, that has not yes. been achieved. Okay, so if it, if, if, if it ever can. So if you allow, I will answer the question backwards. Okay, so in order to know the traders, we need to get order book information. Uh, in, the sing in Singapore, the, s the order book information held by the Singapore Stock Exchange is uh, uh, they cannot share. It is illegal for them to share the SGX uh, information. Uh, we, I, I, I'm still curious to know, you know what, what we can do if we have order book information. So we have started looking elsewhere, other, other markets where uh, it is legal to, for us to share that kind of data, provided we cannot actually identify the trader. So that's one. Now, uh, you talked about, uh, you talked about um, early warning uh, that it is not possible in the, in the stock market. And actually, uh, uh, I, a lot of my current work is, is on uh, forecasting uh, this kind of extreme events. Uh, and we have some kind of success, so I wouldn't say that it's spectacular success. Uh, we managed to uh, forecast uh, the one of the October crashes in 2008, but of course, you know, using historical data, not, not, it's not a live thing. Uh, and the, it requires a, a new template that is invented, that is, uh, that is uh, brought, made, made popular by New Johnson uh, in the University of Miami. Uh, he used that to actually predict uh, how terrorist groups reorganize themselves and carry out attacks. Uh, we don't do that, so we, we just try to, uh, we, 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 ha we take that template, uh, which we cannot use immediately directly because we do not actually know the tra which traders are doing what. But what we, what we did is we developed a mean field theory because a, a, a market crash, a giant market crash requires the formation of a giant cluster, and that giant cluster needs time to grow. So we, 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 work on the, we work on the basis that, that this, this, is, uh, this is what happens in the model. We worked out the mean field implications of such a, grow, uh, gi a giant cluster growing, and then find that uh, based on the signatures that, that can be derived from this, this kind of a template, uh, we, could, we have uh, some uh, measure of uh, predictability uh, for, the, for market crashes, especially big ones. We are testing it live. Uh, but since then, we have started looking at something else. So our our live test is actually running and running and running, and we never never look at it even once. So we, we don't know whether we are successful uh, with uh, with the with the prediction. And of course, uh, I think you might know of uh, Professor Didier Sonnet. He uses a different template uh, for for doing prediction, and he claims to have a much better success. So and I have not matched our live prediction success to his, uh, but one I think soon soon we will start looking at the, 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 that live test. Okay, now back to the, the the intervention part. So in this, I think you're referring to this slide, uh, where okay, actually this next slide, this next slide, where we perform intervention to actually change the natural cause of events. So the 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 the, the, the there is one important ingredient that I did not mention uh, as, I, as I I was talking, uh, and that is uh, in the previous slide. Here, so let me point this out. This thing here, this is a tipping point. Okay, because it is it is the boundary between two different sets of outcomes. So in order to be able to steer a complex system, you have to actually apply force at the tipping point. Applying it elsewhere doesn't do very much because uh, the system is stable here, the system is stable here. Uh, you, you can't change the outcome very much because the outcome is kind of already fixed. But if you, if you know what the tipping point is and you apply, the, you apply your intervention at the right timing, uh, at the right amount, uh, you, may be, you, you are able to uh, uh, effect the change. So that's, that's what happened in chemical catalysis. Uh, that is, they, they actually uh, force they actually force this, this kind of configuration so that instead of this particular transition state, they will arrive at this transition state and then uh, get the outcome that they want. This is DC. So that means that they, they have the catalyst there all the time. But of course, we, I don't think we want any kind of e economic intervention that is there all the time. But it is important that we identify first the tipping point. So that is uh, a, another area of research that uh, my students are working on. 
uh, but uh, I've not in the, uh, incorporated into the, the talk today. But we are, we are working uh, to be able to identify tipping points along with the critical transitions. Good, I think well, we're out of time now, so um, we said we had to move on. Um, but thank you very much, Sian, for a very interesting, fascinating talk about how different patterns can be applied from one system to gain understanding in another. That was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you.